Yo, what's going on, everybody? Today, we got something a little bit different for you, but hopefully you guys are going to enjoy it. You guys know that I've been getting ready for the Houston Half Marathon, and I've been posting my weekly runs over on Instagram, and it has caught the eye of a coach and professional runner, Sage Canada, and he tells me what I've been doing is so appalling that he had to step in, and he wanted to get on a call and tell me everything that I'm doing wrong. So here he is. Sage, welcome to the channel. It's good to see you. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's an honor. Yeah, really cool. Uh, and to be fair, you 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 did not call me saying that like I'm messing it up. Um, uh, but it did catch your eye, though. Is that right? It caught my eye. Yeah, the coach in me, I guess, wanted to to comment. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting different themes and details with like the workouts and the structure of training plans that uh, could be applicable to to a lot of people listening in. Hopefully, so yeah, it's a, a fun experience uh, to talk about running. I love talking cool. about running. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be fun. It'll be, I'm thinking it'll be like a lot like your training talks that you have, uh, and a little bit, I guess, of like a weird thesis defense, if you, you know, like explain yourself kind of thing. Um, so I look forward to it. Um, cause I, I have been getting a lot of questions about like why I'm doing stuff or where I'm getting it from. Um, and I think hopefully this will clear up a lot of that, but first I do want to say congratulations on a, on a good performance in Hawaii, uh, over the weekend. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Honolulu marathon, Got to say, it was the the most humid road marathon race I've ever done. I've done some trail races in the humidity, but it was like 90% humidity. So uh, always an extra challenge when you're dealing with uh, what was for me extreme weather. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's got to be a a really big transition too, coming from the mountains in Salida to go over to the humidity of of like a tropical island. Yeah, well, it's so dry in Colorado. We barely have any humidity. And then, yeah, with yeah. the snow and ice and, well, you know how it is training in that. But, and then the, you know, my last race was, was the 96 mile ultra in, in Chamonix to TDS. So I think that was the last time I saw you uh, yeah. out in Chamonix. Yeah. So, yeah, it was like a big mountain ultra. And then transitioning to the flat pavement is, is also a, a transition that's been hard for me over time. So any service, any distance, it's fun. <laughs> so I've been putting out, uh, it's been, like a weekly reel on Instagram um, that goes over my paces. And um, it's kind of uh, a little bit artificial because I use a nine day cycle and I've been just for the sake of Instagram brevity, I've been doing seven days at a time. Um, but my main point on that was to kind of point out that like I'm a three hour marathoner, um, but my easy runs are all several minutes per mile slower than that. And that's kind of where it started in terms of what I was trying to show or in that like my easy runs really are easy because of the heart rate uh, and everything like that. And so that's where like uh, at least that that reel comes from is that where, like the motivation for that. But I also just wanted to show that like most of my running is just I'm out there having fun, enjoying running and, and doing it in an easy way. And every once in a while, every third day, there's a workout. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, the nine day cycle, uh, we, we actually, you know, as a coach, uh, I've never really been super committed to like a seven day cycle cause it's kind of viewed as being too short, but, uh, we work around that with a lot of athletes and, and our training plans. Cause a lot of people, if you work a traditional nine to five job Monday through Friday, uh, the way the weekend falls, it's, it's usually a good time to put in a quality workout, whether it's a long workout or a long run, cause you might have more time on a Saturday versus uh, a Monday. So that's part of the reason, but generally from a exercise science standpoint and recovery standpoint, it makes more sense to be operating more on a nine or 10 day or 12 day or even 14 day kind of cycle. Uh, so I think, you know, that timing's really good and you're right. It makes it interesting because you're taking these little snapshots on an Instagram reel. You only have, you know, 60 seconds or so, and, mm-hmm. uh, you have to crunch it into seven days because people want to know what's your weekly volume for, for seven days, right? How many miles did you run in seven days? what were the pace changes in seven days? Um, and maybe, or maybe you did uh, a couple workouts. Maybe it was just one quality workout in that span. Yeah. Yeah. And the, like, as it's kind of evolving, the, what the, uh, the point that I'm now trying to emphasize is that like, you know, my easy days, I think that they're truly easy. Uh, I'd be interesting, interested to know if you think that they're either too easy or not easy enough. But the other thing is that I'm trying to focus on now is that like, I'm, I'm kind of running by time and effort at, at this point. Like as much as I love all the, the toys and the technology and I'm, I'm recording the heck out of everything, um, I'm basically, when it boils down to it, I'm going on time and effort. Yeah, that's impressive. You're running with the, the whole GoPro stick. <laughs> Even your races, right? You ran uh, yeah. 256. You say you're a three-hour marathoner. Mm-hmm. 
You're a sub three hour marathoner. Okay. It's a, a significant difference. Uh, All right. Right. 256 at Tokyo earlier this year. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's a great PR and accomplishment. And um, I mean, most people, you say your goal's you know, sub 125 at, at the Houston half, but most people crack 125 in the half first before they crack three hours by that much in, in the full marathon. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, that's a great performance. And that already points to, you know, the potential for running probably significantly under 125 um, in the half. Uh, but I know it's, you know, it's different because you've got a lot of work obligations. You're traveling around a lot. And I'm trying to think what you did in between there. I know you ran, you kind of paced or you were, you kind of took the Chicago marathon relatively chill. Was that the last? Yeah. Yeah, that was like a, a four and a half hour uh, event. I tried to, I wanted to finish as the millionth lifetime finisher of the race. Uh, and I came not that close, but kind of close. I had fun. I had fun trying to get there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, I mean, looking at the, I was looking at your Strava, I was creeping on Strava. Mm -hmm. And, right. uh, you know, I saw what's really good is you have a lot of consistency. So consistent weekly mileage like you're hitting these mileage weeks over 60 miles a week 70 miles a week sometimes so that's what you know over 100k a week volume consistently for the last several months and that's hard to do when you're, you're traveling around and doing different video filming projects and stuff uh so respect for that uh but even going back farther like after tokyo and you know going into chamonix in the summer uh you still have consistency i actually don't see any weeks where you were not you, you know you're training every week pretty much of the year and uh that's usually helps as long as you're staying healthy so i don't know you know we do coaching consultations with people or look at new athletes and the big thing is we want to keep you healthy and happy because if you're healthy and happy you're gonna run well um so you know i, I don't know your injury history and that's usually the biggest risk with like adding speed training or intensity is be like okay does this person have a injury that they're trying to work around or like how are you how have you been feeling with your training in the past eight weeks especially two things that kind of come up i've been lucky enough that i haven't anything that had anything that completely sidelines me but uh when i get very deep into a training block the things that i look out for is like my right knee it, it feels like i've got a little bit i get a little bit of runner's knee from time to time um and then on my right foot um, sometimes it feels like I get like a Morton's neuroma or something that people think is a Nor Morton's neuroma, by the way, I describe, it's like something pokey underneath, uh, my, uh, the pads of my feet and um, will happen when I'm like training much higher amounts of mileage and higher intensity. I think it's just all the pounding, uh, combined with my gait that, that does that. Um, but those are the kind of the things that I kind of look out for and, so far, you know, knock on wood, I haven't really had any problems with either of those um, for the prep for Houston coming up. Uh, I think part of it is that I've intentionally reduced the mileage that I normally do for a marathon because I'm like, well, it's a half marathon, so I shouldn't have to have as much mileage. And I have a longer term goal of, you know, getting ready for 2024. I'd like to run fast in, in London. I'd love to run in, in Berlin. So those would be kind of like two races that I would have like you know, circled on the calendar. And so there's more of like a long-term, like, all right, I'll work hard now, but harder work is coming later. And so even like after Tokyo, like I ran throughout the summer, but I did very little like actual workouts is just mileage for fun, you know, just relaxing. I don't love training in the summer. And so like not having a lot of workouts in the summer is just kind of makes more sense for me. I did spend a lot more time in trails because uh, that's kind of an, a, a pattern that I've enjoyed doing is taking kind of summers off in a way, um, getting off of the pavement, trying to spend as much time in softer surfaces, a variety of um, paces and terrains um, to kind of keep things fresh and let the body recover while I still get to do what I like to do, which is the running. Yeah, no, I agree with that. That's a great, great idea. I do a little bit of that myself. Uh, you know, it's, it's good to change up the focus and give your body some time to kind of recover and ebb and flow throughout the year. Cause you can't be smashing it at a hundred percent, you know, 52 weeks out of the year. It's gotta, you gotta prioritize, okay, this is my a goal. This is my time where I'm working on my speed, 5k, 10k half marathon. And then I go back to extending that to marathon specific. So how you change up your training over the months of the year, uh, really matters. Looking at your training on Strava, there's there are some interesting patterns I did want to comment on, and okay. I guess the first thing I was wondering about was uh, how you track your heart rate. Does it change? Like, are you sometimes wearing a strap 
and then sometimes not. For the most part, I'm using uh, a, a watch on the wrist. And so uh, for a long time, I used a strap. And then a lo- and then after that, I used like a, a higher on the arm band um, because I just didn't, in the winter, I just don't like having to put like conductive gel on it. It's not comfortable for me. And I also felt like the main reason I used the heart rate strap is because I was trying to figure out what low heart rate or what true easy running is. And I felt like after about half a year of really focusing on low heart rate, I felt like I had a pretty a good enough idea. And so I feel like my heart rates that are on Strava over the last, I'd say over a year or so, um, are probably pretty accurate. There's certainly some times where like the wrist, the watch slides down the wrist and maybe it's a little bit higher, but you know, I say for the most part, my easy runs are probably around 140 beats per minute if or lower. And I'd say that's probably very accurate. And then for my workouts, I don't really look at the wrist uh, for my workouts. Um, I'll look at the data afterwards in terms of paces relative to efforts. But um, the heart rate, if it's inaccurate, is probably most inaccurate the faster I'm trying to run. Hmm. Interesting. So, you know, I, I'd actually do more of the opposite approach personally. Uh, okay. For me, I... I can't get an accurate reading with an optical wrist strap mm. like ever. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it's not a, a armband or chest strap, the, the data is not, not good. It depends on how the watch, what, well, what brand and model you're wearing, obviously, but how right. it smooths out the, the algorithm. I'd say for pretty much all brands, the optical doesn't work for a lot of people, but it depends on the person. It depends on if there's, you know, interference and, and, you know, it's different how tight, you're wearing your watch and what type of running you're doing. So there is some variation there. Um, I was digging into the details though on your, on your Strava. Cause I like to look at workout details and I could definitely tell on like some of the workouts, I could give you an example. Um, the, the heart rate was probably not working very well because you're, you're running these workouts, you know, you do six by six minutes, um, one minute recovery, or you're doing, you know, two by five K the other day really good pacing. Your pacing's amazing. Like you're running right at that 629 pace or per mile pace or, you know, four minute per kilometer pace. And you're pacing it really well. You're taking these really defined rest breaks, one minute rest break. You should see these very even heart rate spikes. And on some of those workouts, I, I didn't see that. I saw like jagged lines, which is always a sign that, um, well, you're probably weren't wearing a strap. Uh, I bother, I, I bother my friend, Steven Ganoza about this serious runner. Cause <laughs> when he's not in his serious mode, I was like, you weren't wearing your, your strap that day, that workout, were you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's an interesting thing because I know, you know, some people have commented with it, We could go all into heart rate training, but, uh, you know, if you don't know your hundred percent max heart rate, if you don't know if the watch is tripping an error, sometimes it could skew the data in, in some regards, but then, we also go by pace, of course. So there's that. So you know what your your easy pace is. You know what your race pace is. You know how hard you're breathing as well, right? If you could talk. Uh, so I was, I'd be interested. Have you ever had like a real VO2 max test, like in a lab, or done your own like hard, like what kind of max heart rate have you ever seen? Yeah, no, I've never done any any uh, lab testing, and that's something that I'd love to do at some point. Um, I I think my max heart rate is somewhere like around 184. Based, I mean, like it, it'll peak on the on my tracings like higher than that. Like I've seen it peak as high as like one ninety one, but I don't think it's like, I I think that just might be a reading error or like a very very fleeting kind of thing. But I've seen it where I'm running like five k uh, race pace efforts where it's like it seems like it's hitting that one eighty four, but it's not really getting higher than that. And so that's kind of where I've always been estimating it my max heart rate to be between 181 and 184. Um, it's been a long time since I've really thought about what my max heart rate is. So now I'm a couple years older, so I might, it might be less than that, but that's kind of when, if I have to try to calculate stuff off of like percentage of max heart rate, I usually use numbers starting somewhere around there. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, it's, it's heart rates are really tricky ones. It's a moving target with age. Some people, you know, that you, the rough formula is always, you know, 220 minus your age. Well, uh, you probably don't fall into that. Your heart rate's probably uh, higher than someone who, someone else who might be the same age as you. Just like my max heart rate's probably a lot lower than you, even though I'm a little younger than you. Um, so it's, it's all relative to like genetics and then it changes over time. 
Uh, but then to get a reading in an actual test is actually pretty hard to do. Um, but what you said, 184, if I had to look at your, I looked at your data and I looked at some of the workouts and paces, I was already guessing your lactate threshold <laughs> or, you know, true threshold is probably 172 for workouts and stuff. So then I was thinking, okay, well, if your max is 184, that's like 92% of your max. But then I'm thinking, well, maybe your max is actually in the high 180s uh, and you just haven't pulled it out yet. So it's an interesting Poss thing. Possible. This is all in yeah. theory, but yeah, uh, yeah. it's an interesting yeah. thing to talk about um, because, you know, you say you're doing your easy, easy, you know, uh, I don't know if it's considered moth method or you're just trying to keep it in zone two, uh, you know, 930 per mile pace types of runs, heart rates in the 140. Uh, it, it, you actually could increase your pace three minutes a mile. You go from like 930 per mile pace to 630 per mile pace. And your heart rate really only goes up to like high 160s, 170 about it at, you know, 630 pace. So most people would, would increase a lot more, uh, with that kind of speed increase, but, uh, mm. you know, individual genetics, do make a difference? Yeah. And that's interesting. Cause I always kind of figure my, like my threshold range is in like the 171 to 175, maybe 174 kind of range. So that's that's about what I've been kind of operating on too. Because I've I've noticed that like well, depending on how late into a race or how late into a workout it is, like I generally think of my like my marathon heart rate as like 162 to 167 ish, and then threshold is like 170, 171 to 174, 175. Um, is kind of like where I think about where those efforts kind of end up putting me on the on the heart rate scale. Yeah, no, that's that sounds right to me, and that's that's actually a good point because you know we talk about threshold training. There's a lot of misconceptions out there too, I think. And so when I, when I say threshold, I I guess I'll define it for some people. Uh, for you, it's going to be between your 10k race pace and your half marathon race pace. So you know if you're targeting a sub 125 half marathon, that's you know 84 minutes. Uh, your thresholds actually, your true lactate threshold, uh, is going to be more like what you could sustain for like 45 to 50 minutes in an all out race. So it's, it's longer than, you know, it's slower than 10 K pace, but it might be closer to like 12 K or 15 K race pace theoretically. So it is substantially faster than, uh, your half marathon race pace. And that's actually a good intensity to, to work out at because, you know, say your goal half marathon pace is 629 per mile, about 401 per kilometer pace. If you could do a lot of workouts a little bit faster at the true lactate threshold, like 615 per mile pace, uh, it's going to make 630 pace feel a lot more comfortable and it's going to hopefully lower, uh, speed up your threshold pace. So, you know, you start off, maybe your, your threshold's only 620 per mile. You start doing some more speed work, intensity workouts, you build your efficiency, and you're, you're stimulating fast switch muscle fibers, all of a sudden now you could move at, at 6.15 or 6.10 per mile pace, and that's your lactate threshold. So you've, you've improved it. Then half marathon pace at, at 6.29 per mile feels a lot more comfortable, and you could sustain that for the full uh, over an hour. Yeah, I mean, these numbers are like pretty much spot on to what I was thinking too, because like, you know, I do the same workout, and everyone's like, that's kind of boring. I'm like, well, it's still really hard every time. But the, the paces change over the course of the of the the build. And so like, you know, earlier on when I started getting ready for Houston, that threshold effort was like six thirty five, you know, and lately I've been down to like six twenty for the first four and then it maybe slows down a little bit for the last two. With the with the hope that like, you know, there's not a lot of time left. But my thinking was that ideally by the time we get to the taper you know, I'd be running them at like 6.15s, maybe 6.10s if things were going really well. Um, but that's kind of like the thinking if I wanted to run 6.30s for half a marathon. Yeah, so I saw that uh, there was a lot of repetition of a six by a special 6x6-minute <laughs> six yeah. six workout, one-minute rest. It's very good because you're, yeah. you're basically doing, you know, it's close to a mile repeat, and you're yeah. targeting, you know, half marathon race pace. I was interested in seeing why that particular workout, maybe it's because you just enjoy it, uh, yeah. was repeated yeah. over and over, like yeah. almost every week. Sometimes I feel like it fell twice in a in a nine day span. Even I guess it yeah. depends on oh, the yeah. week. But uh, yeah. I was just wondering, like, why <laughs> why the same workout so many times in a row? 
Uh, yeah. Well, one of it is it's just easy. Then I don't have to think about the workout. Um, and I wanted to do a lot, even for a marathon build, I like doing a lot of threshold work. Um, part of it is, uh, comes from like my, the two, you know, inspirations for it are Bob Larson and Jack Daniels. And so in Bob, Bob Larson didn't write a book, but there was a book about Bob Larson. And he talked about like when he was running, um, it was that community college in the like Inland Empire, like the Hamel Toads. He took all these kids that were community college kids that lived in the area. So it's not like he was recruiting from all over the country. And he just had these kids run at threshold effort. Didn't even suggest a pace, but he's just like that threshold effort. The pace you could run for 40 to 60 minutes, you know, uh, uh, like for a race. And they just got better. And, and he took those kids that just happened to live within like a 50 mile radius and made them state champions. And I was like, that's pretty interesting. And then he went on to become one of the greatest coaches of all time. And then in Jack Daniels, he talks about doing mile repeats all the time, but looking at it, he does the mile repeats with about a minute rest in the workouts that he writes. But then he's like, he also writes elsewhere in the book. And if you're running this many miles a week, it's probably because you can run a mile repeat in about five to six minutes. He's like, what I'm looking for is a specific work to rest ratio. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll call them quote unquote mile repeats, but I'll do them at six minutes. So I have like the six to one work to rest ratio. And his rationale was that that way you're doing a lot of threshold work, but recovering enough to let you do 36 to 40 minutes of threshold work in a session without having to run a, like 40 minutes of threshold work at once, which could be really taxing. And so it's his way of getting that much work in a session while hopefully letting your body recover a little bit, but not letting the heart rate come all the way down. It's not a full recovery. So you're still tired before you get into the next second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth rep. So that's the rationale behind that workout. And so I've kind of slapped those two things together and I'm like, I'll do both of those. I'll just do a lot of threshold work. And that mile repeat is a great way to do a lot of that threshold work. I liked the workout. It was, it helped me to, as I got ready, when I broke three for the first time at grandma's and then for Tokyo, it was a workout that I just did a lot again. Cause I just, if I have to like write it down and there's like four different distances and paces, like I'm just like, my brain can't handle it all. And so, um, I just kept doing it over and over again and I had good results. So like, and now I'm just like, it's almost superstition at this point. It's a one that I think my body responds well to. I think there's reasonably decent science behind it maybe. Um, and it's a good confidence builder for me. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good workout. And it, yeah, Daniel's cruise intervals, uh, essentially I did find it interesting. Uh, I don't mean to be critical here, too mm -hmm. critical, yeah. but, uh, you know, you're calling it threshold and it's in the threshold realm, but I, again, back to the definition of, of, you know, more like 10 K pace work. I think your thresholds probably is more like closer to, to six ten or six fifteen, or at least you want it to be rather mm -hmm. than just targeting half marathon goal pace at six twenty nine. that should be slower than your true lactate threshold. Uh, mm -hmm. so if you're doing something shorter and you could definitely get away with it, if you did even shorter intervals, like mm -hmm. kilometer repeats or 800 meter repeats, you could kind of bridge that speed gap, uh, getting closer to almost VO2 max, but still riding the line into lactate threshold. So, uh, you know, people are thinking like zone four type of intensity. Um, cause then you're, then you're moving at, you know, closer to six flat per mile pace. Uh, cause I saw a lot of your workouts. Um, it's a great workout. It was repeated a lot. And a lot of times <laughs> it's right at six, it's in the six twenties. It looks like usually, but I know, yeah. you know, the other day you, you did, you changed it up a bit and you did two by five K or two by three miles, uh, which is mm -hmm. also a great workout, but you had commented that it, it might be, I don't know if it felt uncomfortable or it felt like something you're like, I don't know if I could hold this for the full Houston yeah. half, given the time frame and, uh, the, the pace goal. And we, we don't know what the weather's going to be like in Houston either, yeah. but, yeah. um, I didn't know if how you were feeling maybe about that last workout or changing up the workouts in these last four weeks. Yeah. So like now that we're like, the the ideal goal was like within six weeks of Houston is to start getting very race specific. So until then I hadn't done anything that was going to be at what felt like a half marathon effort. And so that other run the other day where I did have a larger interval, but at what felt like half marathon effort, um, was an attempt to start that. 
and then this week I did another one where the last week was like three times two miles, I think. And then this week was two times 5k. Um, so making those intervals longer to get more of that kind of like, this is what race effort feels like, uh, kind of nailed down in my mind. And I guess in uh, physiologically too. Uh, and so like, that's where like race specific efforts are starting to come in. And it, I felt like it was race specific effort, but then like towards the end of that last 5k, I'm like, this is, this feels tired. I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm, this is really hard. And I was just like, I can't imagine doing more than double that without, and I, you know, it was a very long, cause I just did it on a loop. There's like a four and a half mile loop. And so like I run the flat, I, I do the interval on the flat part. And then there's a very hilly part for Boston. I'll do work on the hilly part. But for this, I was like, I'll jog the hilly part. And so it ended up being a little bit more than a mile recovery. So it's a really, really long recovery, two 5Ks at, and they ended up like 6.30 for the first one and 6.34 for the second one. And I was like, it, if I'm trying to run at 125, 6.34s shouldn't feel so hard is kind of like where, so it's just a little bit of down. I mean, I'm not tapered. I'm still you know, doing my leg day sessions and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a little bit to kind of like play around with mentally, but it just felt like, I don't know, we're like four weeks, three weeks away. And just, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. You're four weeks, a little over four weeks away okay. right now. So that's <laughs> okay. better good. than three weeks. Good. Good. Um, good. Good. And uh, yeah, I think it, it, it mainly feel like it was your, like your legs were sluggish. Like you didn't have the turnover. Like it's more of a speed thing or did you, were you actually like breathing really hard? Uh, I see your heart rate only got up huh. into the 170s at the very end of the second rep. Um, yeah, it just felt like I was working. It felt like I just really had to try hard. Um, and my legs felt fine, um, I guess. I, I, and the thing, the thing is, like, I have I just not been doing enough of the race-specific training? So my brain is like, hey, we're not used to running more than six minutes at a time. Like, what's this? So, like, that's kind of like hopefully, you know, getting a couple more longer sessions, you know, maybe once a week. Uh, in the remaining weeks where I can do a little bit of a longer interval will help kind of deal with that. I think a lot of it's going to be in my head, but it just felt like, I don't know, it just, there just wasn't, there wasn't anything left to, there wasn't any more, you know, the throttle was down. I just didn't feel like there was more throttle to give, you know? Okay. I like that throttle analogy, like shifting <laughs> gears. Well, no, it, it, uh, <laughs> You know, from an outside perspective, and again, this is just limited perspective. I came in last minute here, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the coach and me, just looking at at you know some of these things, I'd say you you probably still have time to shift gears a little bit in training. And again, I don't want to injure you because there's always an injury risk mm -hmm. to to doing these things. But uh, potentially, you could definitely do a couple workouts. Uh, like if I was coaching you, for example, I would say like, oh, like. You know, we should probably do some 800 meter repeats, like eight by 800. And we're going to do those, you know, sub, sub three minutes a piece, like 255, like sub six minute mile pace. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you're getting into that 5k, 10k pace realm. It's almost like a VO2 max intensity, maybe not quite that hard, but it's, it's speed training for half marathon pace. Right. And then, you know, the next week or 10 days later, 12 days later, that could even be you know, six by or eight by a kilometer. Um, so kilometer repeats, 800 meter repeats. Great because there are these, you know, three to four minute efforts and you're working at a higher intensity, but it teaches the legs to move faster and it's going to help lower your threshold, uh, so to speak, um, because you're building up uh, that specific musculature to get used to even more intense pace and higher levels of lactate and higher heart rate spikes. Uh, so that could be one thing that, that could help you and it could still kick in, uh, within this limited time frame. Okay. The other thing I'd see just looking at your training, uh, it looks like you haven't done like any longer, long run efforts. And obviously you're not marathon training, so you don't want to, you don't need to do these 20 mile hard long runs, but we're always big on doing some sort of speed work, long speed work sessions during a long run where you're actually doing like you know, 14, 15, 16 miles all at once on your feet. And some of that's warm up miles, some of that's cool down miles, but in between maybe you're doing, you know, uh, four times two mile repeats at 620 pace, 615 pace with a, with a short rest. So that's, that's building a lot of, that would be a hard session. You probably only have time for like doing one of those <laughs> between now and before yeah. you have to taper. But, uh, 
you know, that kind of strings together the aspect of speed, but also extending that stamina and that speed endurance, so to speak, uh, so that, you know, when you get to 10 miles in, in the half marathon, you still have confidence that you could close down that last 5k. Cause you know, you get 10 miles in and a half, that's a really tough point. People usually fall apart in the last, you know, three, four miles. So, um, that would just be, uh, my two cents on that. I don't know yeah, how no, you think about no. that. We're actually, we're exactly on the same page because I was thinking like, even this week, my, you know, quote unquote long run was going to be two of like 5k at half marathon effort. Um, I was hoping to have that within like 13 to 15 miles of a, a total run with, you know, like a little bit of a, with cool, longer kind of easy efforts on each end of that. Uh, I just ran out of time. Yeah. Know? And so oh, that's like, a good idea. Yeah. And so like what's, what I typically do, I, I know how to do this for marathons. And so I pull out of the Jack Daniels book, he'll do like, you know, like 10 miles at marathon effort inside of like a 16 mile run, you know? And so like something like that is something that I do. Um, couple times uh several times during the marathon training block or if it's earlier in the block i might chunk it up like four miles or maybe five miles with a mile of uh, easy running in between there uh it's just with half marathons i'm just like i don't i don't know what the workouts are you know yeah, and so yeah. i've been kind of winging it as i go you could do uh like three mile warm-up then you do uh three times two mile repeats at 620 mm -hmm. per mile pace with okay. a half mile jog in between each so Okay. You know, three miles, and then you got you got six miles of quality. Mm -hmm. You're already up to nine. You've got the half mile recovery jogs. You're up to eleven. Um, yeah. You could even do four times two miles in the middle there, and then do a couple mile cool down. Mm -hmm. And you got a sixteen mile medium long run with a lot yeah. of quality, six to eight miles okay. of quality. And if, if it's at six twenty pace, and you shorten the interval to only two miles, uh, you know you could run at that faster than six twenty nine pace. So you're you're running. You okay. know, in between that 10K to half marathon pace. And that's going to be a hard workout. Um, that is going to be hard. Two, two miles at 620s feels like a, feels tough right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah um, it's a little first, intimidating. First, I mean, you could do some more leg turnover stuff because I saw, mm. you know, you did do, it looked like 16 by 400, mm -hmm. 16 by a quarter mile um, yep. earlier. I think it was about a week ago mm -hmm. uh, with a short rest. And that's good prep for that, you know leg turnover you had a short rest on it it was an 85 second rest on 85 mm -hmm. seconds running a quarter mile 400 meters uh so that's you know and you called it like 5k realm it's like 540 530 mile pace right so that's really good leg turnover i would extend that up next to eight by 800 or at least eight by okay. three minutes it doesn't have to be 800 okay. you're, you're gonna be doing yeah. them around three minutes each so but yeah. it's you know okay. sub six minute mile pace that's gonna help make 629s feel more comfortable too and give you okay. a little boost in in vo2 max um but you know again it's a it's a injury risk with adding more muscle tension into the equation but i think uh you could definitely do that sure do you have an opinion on how to arrange that so like if you've got a long run with half marathon effort you're doing you know faster work with these 800 meter repeats and then threshold work like how does that how do you sprinkle that through is there like a sequence that you like or does it matter uh, it matters how soon you have to taper and when your race is. So we will work backwards <laughs> yeah. from the race. Yeah. Uh, cause obviously yeah. you don't want to be doing your hardest long run workout a week before the race or two weeks sure. before the yeah. race. It's more like yeah. you should do it like three weeks before the race, but mm -hmm. the shorter speed workouts, you definitely can do slightly closer to the race, mm -hmm. right? You're still doing speed workouts, maybe in the taper phase, you just reduce the volume. You're sure. not, you okay. know, instead of doing uh, eight by 800, you do six by 800. And so the speed's still there. Um, obviously you don't want to do anything super hard the, the last probably 10 days before the race, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the speed workouts you adapt to faster and they kick in faster. Whereas the long runs take more time to adapt for the body to get, uh, the benefits and it also beats you up more. So, you know, at this point you're always looking backwards. What'd you do? What was your last workout, hard workout? What was, what do you have in the future? what's your travel schedule like maybe or work schedule. Um, generally it's good to do some speed first, like do the 800s first. And then the net workout after that would be the long run workout. Okay. And then the next workout after that would be another speedy workout. Cause then, you know, there's only so many long runs you could do, but you could definitely do a couple speedier, okay. faster workouts. Um, 
in between there. So that's kind of the sequence, but definitely, you know, two easy days in between each harder day, at least, uh, generally yeah. sometimes we have okay. people, people take three easy days after a yeah. really hard long run workout. Uh, it's more during marathon training, but yeah, okay, uh, that's kind of the sequence. Cool. All right. And then, you know, since this is YouTube, we got to make it a contest. Any, any predictions that you're willing to put down for, for a half marathon in Houston in I guess four weeks, is it? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's four weeks from this weekend. Uh, yeah, okay. you're about a month out. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's going to be close. <laughs> you could, you could be, you could be harsh. It's yeah, going to be close. I, I'd okay. say. I mean, on paper, there's you should be able to crack 125. Uh, yeah, your your okay. marathon PR is is definitely pointing to, uh, you know, a sub 125. That being said, you know, you, I know you call yourself more of a, a slow twitch muscle fiber guy. You seem to be. Mm -hmm probably better suited for the marathon distance compared to like a 5k or a 200 meter mm -hmm. sprint. I'm kind of the same yeah. way. I'm like all slow yeah. twitch. So like, you know, 5k it, it's, it's hard. Um, so, you know, there's a chance you might not crack 125. Um, I, I'll predict, <laughs> I'll predict 124 40. Okay. I'd say, right. uh, okay. <laughs> I'm a little worried if, if you change your, tra if you change your training, <laughs> Okay. Uh, don't just do six by six minutes from here to yeah, the yeah. race. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because it's it's too monotonous and you might get a little stale. Um, mm. I do like repeating workouts and seeing progress, but uh, it's generally good to change up the paces so you have that gear shifting ability. Okay. Uh, the other thing with Houston, you know, I've I've run the marathon there four times. Um, the weather is usually really good. It's usually really fast. Mm. It's a fast half course, especially, but there's always a chance it could be hot and humid a little bit. There's mm -hmm. been a couple okay. of years during the marathon where it was actually hot and humid. Uh, so, you know, depending on the wind direction and the weather that could really change your time as well. Uh, but yeah, assuming good weather conditions and, and your health, staying healthy, that's really the most important thing. Uh, I, I definitely say you have a chance to crack 125. I definitely say there's a chance that you don't crack 125 though. Yeah, if I'm going to yeah. be harsh. I, I could, I could also yeah, no, see I, like a, uh, uh, yeah. a 126. Um, but yeah, a, it's yeah it is hard that's, to predict even as a coach I, um it's, I, I think it's I, gonna be close though i think it's gonna be close i'll have a shot at it I, i'm think i'm thinking that i'm 126 is more likely than something that has a 124 in front of it is is kind of where where i'm at um but it'll 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 depend like you know like i wish i could have switched gears from kind of just like getting in used to doing workouts and that's where i use that threshold workout to doing more kind of like race specific work. Like I started doing some more 400 meter repeats. I wish I could have done a little bit more development in that, in that kind of speed range. And then I wish I could have had more time to do some half marathon specific work too, but you know, we are where we are. So we'll see what I can do in the next two, two weeks. You think a two week, I usually do a 10 day taper for a, a marathon. Do you think that about that is about right? A 10 days. Yeah. A 10 days is a good taper yeah. time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you definitely don't want to smash a the hard long run workout within ten or twelve days, but right. you could still be doing like a high intensity interval session, like VO two max, eight uh, hundreds or kilometer repeats, okay. sub three. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple of those leg turnovers could really help boost you in these final four weeks. Okay, cool. And then going forward, I have some questions because I'd ideally, you know, I still don't even have a bib for London, but I'm I'm planning as if I'm going to find a way to get over there. Um, you know, what I've been doing for this session is I've been, I've been doubling on a lot of days just to kind of break up how like the easy, not only break up the easy runs, but also, um, to figure out how to put in like a, some weight training, uh, in the day as well. And one of the things I'm going to be doing, or I've kind of already started shifting a little bit is instead of having a threshold session in the morning and then weights in the afternoon, um, I've shifted to threshold in the morning and then a, another kind of like even threshold second threshold effort is not the right word for it. Cause it's a little bit slower than that, but another faster session to have a double kind of workout day. Um, what are your thoughts on, on like the concept of double threshold or something that kind of looks like double threshold? Oh yeah. It's, it's kind of all the buzz now. Yeah. Um, personally, I'm not a huge fan. Mm. Uh, Sandy and I've talked about this on a podcast. Um, mm. it's, I think it's great. It, it really depends on the, the devils in the details, so to speak, mm. and the context mm. of your training. 
Um, like in theory, it works because if you go out and run hard every day, it's going to get you in shape really fast, really quick. And you could get in phenomenal shape doing a lot of threshold work all the time, right? The risk reward ratio though changes and the, the risks in my mind, sometimes the injury risk, especially out outweighs the possible rewards. So the biggest thing that's the biggest risk is it's a lot of impact force in one day or in a short period of time. Right. So like, um, if you were, let's say you get too tired after the morning session, maybe you go a little too hard and then you're exhausted in the afternoon session. It's frustrating because you're not hitting your pace and you're straining and you start running with bad form. It's potentially an injury risk, but I mean, if you hold it together and you stay healthy, it's a great fitness boost. Uh, and you're learning to run fast on tired legs, which is kind of the name of the game in, in distance running. Um, usually with, with athletes, we've coached and maybe just cause I'm an old traditionalist and trained people before super shoes. I think the super shoes have helped boost the idea of double threshold. I think there's a reason why a lot of pros do double threshold, but it's not necessarily as time effective for a lot of people. And it's generally more of an injury risk for, um, people that aren't elite probably. Um, I, I've never do it, do it myself personally either. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a risk with the, the injury is the main thing. Um, but yeah, doubling could be good when you're increasing your, your weekly volume and mileage and you're trying to add in, you know, weight, weight work and other things, a mobility. Um, so yeah, it's a double edged sword, so to speak okay. with the double threshold. Yeah. I mean, uh, I just started doing them. I think last week was the first time I did it for this block. Um, and I was thinking that like, you know, normally if I'm doing a workout every three days, I do a leg day that same day in the, in the afternoon. And then one to two of those days I would remove from the gym and put that back. Usually I just do like a little warm up 5k at basically half marathon pace, maybe even a little slower. Um, and then a little cool down for that second session in the day. But most of my doubling has been just adding another 30 minutes in the, in the afternoon. It, I don't love it. I got to say, um, cause it's very time consuming. It's just 30 minutes, but it just seems to be so time consuming, but it's made my morning runs a lot easier. And then I'm on my feet less than 90 minutes, which I feel like is a more ideal time for me to do an amount of time to do an easy run. So that's just kind of the rationale behind my doubles. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a tricky thing. Uh, and you're kind of right at that mileage threshold where, you know, we'd say, okay, maybe you get more benefit doing more singles. Uh, mm. cause you know, 70, 80 miles a week. Okay. Start throwing in some doubles. It's good for your metabolism. It's good mentally mm. to break things up and have a true recovery day. At the same time, it's also good to be out on your feet for 80 or 90 minutes all at once. So like, what's the, the old saying, is it better to do one 10 mile run? or two mm -hmm. six mile runs. And a lot of people exactly. would argue the single 10 mile run is actually better, even though you're yeah. getting 10 versus 12 miles in for the day. But uh, yeah, you know, so it, it depends so, on the day, you could break it up. <laughs> it's very close to what my, my, my actual dilemma is. Do I go do a 10 mile run that usually takes me about like around an hour and 40 minutes, maybe a little bit less? Or do I do, usually what I've been doing lately, uh, a lot of it's just due to schedule, is an eight, to eight and a half mile run and then three miles in the afternoon. So I'm getting, you know, 10 miles or 11 and a half. <laughs> it's the exact uh, thing that I've, and today is going to be a six miles in the morning and six miles in the afternoon. Again, just because of the way schedule worked out. So I'm like, I guess I'm just a big running cliche at this point. No, no, I, I, I do the same thing. I've done some six yeah. and six doubles. It's probably because yeah. uh, yeah, you're talking to me right now and cut into <laughs> your training time. Uh, yeah. The, you know, the other comment I have on, on that is, uh, I, I don't know if you're like, you've probably done some, I know you've done some talks on like moth, moth method mm -hmm. and, uh, low heart rate training. Some of your easy days runs are, are, are really, really easy on the easy side. I'd say, I think it's okay. good because most be, most people need to slow down on their easy runs and, you know, it's all, you know, zone two training or zone mm -hmm. one, you want to recover, you don't want to get hurt, but like. I think you might benefit maybe from doing some runs a, a little faster. Like okay. you don't have to be like eight minute miles, but like nine flat instead of nine forty five per mile pace. If you're at sea okay. level in good conditions, I okay. know a lot of times you're running, you're filming stuff. So you have a GoPro yeah. and a stick or it's icy out and windy. Um, yeah. but I, I was looking at some of those paces and I was like, man, that's like, you know, that's a good three minutes a mile slower than his marathon race pace. Um, 
and I'm not saying go out and push every day because most, again, most people, they, they do right. push too hard on their easy days. And, it, you know, the patience and going slow has allowed you to build up and, and run marathon PRs and, and improve a lot. So I don't want to like <laughs> take away from that, but it's, that's a pretty extreme pace change. Um, okay. Yeah. Three minutes a mile, considering you're a sub three hour marathon runner, right? So like. Okay. You know, I know that a lot of pros will post on social media. They're like, you know, I, I race the marathon at low five minute mile pace. I'm running eight minute mile pace. That's a big change too. But realize they're probably doing a lot of workouts at like 440 mile pace and a lot of tempos even faster. So, uh, yeah, it's it's all relative. Um, okay. But it it could help um, in the future when you when you're building up for London. Um, okay. All right, that's good to know. Um... Because I have been, I'm like, sometimes I'm out there and I'm like, well, I'm having fun, but this is a lot of time at very easy pace. And I'm like, because uh, I'm, because like when I, I haven't done this until I started making those Instagram reels, because I'm also now tracking like the total time that I'm exercising. And like, even if I'm also including like the gym workouts, I'm like, it's 11 hours a week. It's only, it's only quote unquote, it's like, it's like 70 miles will take me like 11 hours. And I'm like, that's, well, one, it means my easy runs are very slow, but also, and which I'm fine with that, like that, I don't care about that, but I'm just like, it's a lot of time on feet. Am I maximizing my time? You know, I'm like, that's kind of like, I'm like, uh, is there something else I should be doing? You know, that's, so I do wor worry about that a little bit. Yeah. I, I, I mainly, I'm not worried about it. It's mainly, I know that's a big time commitment. I was thinking, mm -hmm. I don't know if I put in more than 11 hours of training for <laughs> this last marathon. Yeah. Uh, it helps to run at faster paces, but, yeah. um, it's more like we don't want your form to get too sloppy because uh, mm -hmm. if you're running, you know, 10 minute mile pace for someone at your level, who's, who's run a marathon at 639 per mile pace average, right? Your marathon race pace is 639, I think 640. So I think like 642, 643. Okay, like so that. like yeah. significantly under seven minutes a mile. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean your easy day pace has to be eight flats, but like okay. nine flat, nine nine minute miles is a big difference compared to a ten minute mile in terms of what your stride rate might be and and what your leg turnover mm -hmm. is. Of course, it's it's always okay to go yeah. out and do fun group runs and film stuff mm -hmm. and be walking and <laughs> going, you know, mm -hmm. twelve fifteen minute mile pace at times. Uh, but yeah, generally there are some runs where you probably could definitely go like like nine flat pace at least. Um, it's, okay. I mean, it's a marginal difference, but it's mainly just because uh, we don't want to get sloppy with, with our running form. Uh, and it's got to feel easy to you. Like you're not breathing probably really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're easy runs, you know. Uh, and so sometimes I'm like, that's where I'm like, yeah, they're easy runs and I'm out there for a while. So I'm like, hey, am I doing this right? Yeah. I know I've been doing it like this for a couple of years now, but yeah. like, is it, am I ready to do something else? Yeah. You know, do you ever kinda, do um, any strides after these easy runs? Like, uh, sometimes to be completely honest, the only time I do strides is when I'm testing out a new shoe. Okay. And so like, if I have a lot of easy like paces and if it's a daily trainer, uh -huh. you know, I do like to test it. What happens when you go a little faster? What happens when you go a little slower? And that's usually the only time that I'll do strides. Cause otherwise I'm like, I could do strides, but I got to work out. Either I just did a workout yesterday or I got a workout tomorrow. So I don't do a lot of strides. So that's kind of my rationale for not doing them. It's probably not a good reason, but that's the reason. Yeah. I mean, you get a lot of benefits. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be like sprints. You know, I say strides. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, four to six by 100 meters or mm -hmm. 15 to 20 second pickups really at faster yeah. than 5K pace, right? It doesn't have to be this hard mm -hmm. thing. But that's a good way to sprinkle in something at the end of okay. a super easy run. Uh, even if you have a workout the next day or you did a workout, mm -hmm. um, obviously you don't want to do it if it's yeah. sore and pull your Achilles okay. in a new shoe, but uh, that's a, <laughs> a good variation also. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. All right. And then um, how, how do you approach uh, your leg days uh, in the training block in terms of like, do you maintain that throughout? Because this is like my really my first time having gym sessions during a training block where do you keep it all the way through is it like the running where you're still doing it just less weight as you get close to the race or do you stop at some point or how do how do you approach that you know personally i don't do leg day <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I i don't really lift that much at all um okay. i see it as a tool to a it's great for 
looking good naked, <laughs> keeping you fit. Okay. There's you, know, you know, yeah. there's there's the vanity reasons why I could lift. Um, I, I do some lifting. I'll get into that. But mm-hmm. the other reason is it's mainly an injury prevention thing. So, okay, you have some calf issues. Maybe you need to do more calf raises because your, your calves are imbalanced. So you have a muscle imbalance uh, with your glutes, something like that. Um, I, t- I target more of the core if I do lift. So it's not like just legs or just upper body. It's more I'm always targeting mm-hmm. the core. And you, you do with leg day because if you're doing squats or deadlifts, like that's obviously working your core. And I say, when I say core, I'm including the hips and the glutes, the lower back, the lower abs. But that's really, if you have time to lift weights, that's really where I put the focus. Unless you have a specific injury problem or you're trying to boost your running form in some certain way. And for a lot of people, that is focusing on the legs more than the arms, right? We're not <laughs> trying to bench. I don't want to increase my bench press or you know, lift a ton of upper body weight necessarily. So legs and core, definitely really good. Uh, to address your question though, I definitely would taper it down uh, in the okay. last couple weeks. Like you could do some, I would reduce, I would reduce the weight and the reps a little bit. Uh, so like it's more just maintenance, right? You don't want to just totally go cold turkey and not do any yeah. lifts that you've been used to, but you want to just keep some sort of muscle tension there. So yeah, in the last two weeks, taper it down. You probably don't have to lift in the last, five days and if you do lift you don't want to be going for any any weight prs definitely sure. Re- if yeah. anything reduce the weight reduce the reps just do it for maintenance um but uh yeah it really depends on the person and the exact routine and the form of their lifts and uh all that i mean it's it's great all around stuff because it helps boost your muscle mass and it could help boost testosterone it helps boost your metabolism in a lot of different ways it makes you feel stronger so you know weightlifting's great but yeah i just wouldn't overdo it all right, cool. Thanks, thanks for uh, the the training plan audit uh, or co- coaching consultation. Oh, I don't um, want to sound like the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's good because I know you and I have kind of always chatted over the years, you know, about stuff that that I'm doing and kind of why. So ho- hopefully that answers some of the the questions that I know that a lot of people that watch me have been asking, and some of the questions that I know that you probably had some follow ups. So hopefully we got to all those today. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great uh, looking at your training and seeing you progress and seeing you mix it up in the, you know, running in the trails and Chamonix and stuff. And, yeah, that's, that's fun. Uh, yeah, I would say with like, if you ever get into, you know, ultra running and, and trail running more, it's then time becomes a bigger metric, like tracking how many ah. hours a week, time on feet, vertical gain, uh, rather than just miles and pace, because that goes out the window on the technical sure. trails, yeah. mountain trails. Um, yeah, but sense. yeah, it's great to, to see you hit your sub three hour marathon goal and uh, train for this half marathon and then hopefully yeah, London next. So uh, really cool. Yeah. I'm sure I'll see you around right. at, at some events, hopefully uh, start yeah. of 2024. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And if people want to get a coaching consultation like this or hire you as a coach, where can they find you? Uh, you can follow our, our uh, coaching website. My girlfriend, Sandy and I uh, do higher running. So at higher running, higher running.com. So yeah, thanks for the plug. <laughs> All right, no problem. Well, thank you uh, so much. And uh, we look forward to hearing about what your next race is going to be so we can cheer you on there. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it.